Good afternoon. This is Robin Kirby Ghetto. Welcome to today. It's going to be an awesome day in the Lord. Amen. As you join on, be hopeful and expectant. The Holy Spirit is going to strengthen you. He has got such a word in due season that it is just going to uh, cause you to abound in great grace. And you're going to prosper in your soul. Amen. So as you join on here, you just be expecting that Holy Spirit is going to strengthen you. I know I told some people that I was going to be on just a little bit later today, but I actually was able to resolve a matter and come on a little bit earlier. And so God just wants me to strengthen you. We're going to look at the attacks of the enemy in this hour being under your feet. Amen. It is such an hour of just tribulation and trials and the testing of our faith. 1 Peter 1, 6, and 7, and we are just rejoicing in it. We are just going to be so glad in it today. We're going to have such the joy of the Lord, and we are going to see God put the enemy under our feet. Amen. And so as you join on, you be super hopeful and expectant. Hey, Barbara, so good to see you. Love you. Hey, Derek. Hey, Trisha. God bless you. Thank y'all for joining in. It is so good to have you on. And as we get ready for the message, let us enter into it with prayer. Amen. God, we just thank you. We thank you for grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word, Father, that you are going to cause us to abound. And God, I just take authority over heaviness that is coming against your people and command it to be lifted off in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of the Lord. And God, we just call forth your garment of expressive praise. And we thank you, Father, for the expression of the truth of your word in Jesus Christ as you give us knowledge, as you give us wisdom, and as you give us understanding so that we receive that inheritance which we've been given from you, Father, of resurrection power in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Patricia, thank you for joining in. So we are going to look today. There has been such a massive assault of the enemy against the minds of the church. Those that are just trying to press in to know Christ Jesus. Those that are pursuing holiness. There has been such an assault of the enemy. And God wanted me to come on today. And he wanted us to go through Romans 8. And we're going to look at one of the things that the Father has been telling me ever since the middle of this year as He is a good God and He is working what? All things what? To our good. And that's Romans 8, 28. And we're going to get to that today. But God is really going to expose the condemner. That is Satan. Satan means accuser, slanderer. It is Satan that accuses us before the Lord. But thanks be to God in Christ Jesus, we are blood-bought. And when we ask forgiveness for our sins, we it is washed away when we turn into repent when we turn to repentance. Amen. And so we're going to look at one of the things which the enemy has been doing as of late. And God is just going to bring such grace. As you see that the traps that have been set for you, that God is just going to snap them. And He is going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you knowledge. You're going to just be able to, by the Holy Spirit, dust yourself off and rise up again. Amen. Because one of the things that the condemner is doing is causing us to feel bent over and oppressed with our humanity. I thank God for allowing me to know how human I am, that I am not this super saint. I am just not that. I need Christ Jesus. I lean upon Him. I lean upon God, the Holy Spirit, because there is not one thing that is good inside of me except Christ. Amen. And as Scripture says, that the heart is deceitful above all things, that we do not even know what is in our heart. And so the condemner is working overtime and trying to make us feel oppressed, trying to make us feel condemned, to feel guilty, that we cannot draw near to God. And we will look at James 4, 8 today about drawing near to God in repentance with a change of a mindset. Now, 
some of the things that you should be experiencing in this hour as you're pursuing God is behaviors within your person that have need to be pruned. They're not good fruit. Those behaviors are being pruned off of our person right now. And that is what? It is John 15, 2, that we are pruned in order to what? Bear more excellent fruit. So those things are being pruned from our person in order that that excellent fruit, well, John 15, 8, what? Glorify the Father, amen. So let us look at Romans 8. We're going to start in verse 20. We're actually going to read several verses. At, hey, Renee, thank you for joining in. It's so awesome to see you. And so we're going to look at Romans 8, and then we're going to go to Rome, John, James 4, and we're going to look at James 4 in a greater measure, and we're going to see about drawing near to God in repentance. Amen. So let's get to Romans 8. We will go to verse 20, Romans 8, 20. And I love this scripture, and this is one of the main scriptures that I use when God has me unpack the different sciences, such as chemistry, anatomy, physics, astronomy, biology. He has me use Romans 1.20, but Romans 1.20 is going to be a segue into the scripture that God is going to have us unpack today. And it's interesting because Romans 7 is telling us as we see that wrestling inside of Paul where he says, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. And if it's no longer me that's doing it, then it's that sin principle at work in my members. In fact, before we get to Romans 8, let us get to Romans 7. And we're going to go about verse 20 there as well. And we're going to look at this wrestling match that is going on inside of Paul. And this can be likened to Genesis 32 as with Jacob. That Jacob has all that which he has identified with across the Jabbok. And God gets Jacob alone. And he's across the Jabbok. And what Jabbok means in Hebrew is to empty yourself, to empty oneself. And so what's happening in this wrestling match is Jacob has been under fear. How do we know this? In Genesis 32, 1, he sees two angelic armies. And those two angelic armies do not change Jacob's status. It doesn't change his emotions. It doesn't change his mind. It doesn't bring repentance. Repentance comes when there has been a union with God. And we see this with the word, Mark 4, that as that seed is sown in the soil, which is our soul, some yields 30, 60, and 100 fold harvest when it is in good soil. And that is where the persecution begins in our soul, is when the word is trying and the word is tested that's what's happening in this wrestling match and so as with jacob he's really wrestling with his old nature he's been called to be a blessing to the nations he knows about abram abraham he knows about isaac the promises that have been passed down to his father and jacob is in this wrestling match and he has this burden and he thinks that this is all upon me and he realized how inept he is for the call and so he sees two angelic armies and he still has fear about seeing Esau his brother from whom he stole the birthright we know that God was in the midst of all that was going on because the promise was to pass to Jacob because Esau would sell his stomach, his appetite for the blessing. And that's what we're going to look at today is that wrestling match inside of you that would be like Esau. God is pruning it because you would sell out if you operated in that state, in that nature. Hey, Sue, God is going to show you 
that as he is pruning you, that there is a wrestling in your person and he is going to empty you out of the stuff within you that is rotten, stuff that is of the lies of the enemy. As Jesus talked about in Matthew 12, 29, with the strong man binding the strong man and about emptying his house of his equipment. So in order to understand that, when we go to Romans 7, let me briefly just make mention of this for those of y'all who have not joined me before on different teachings I've done over the past year. And it is a cult course, The Mind and the Body. Romans 12, 1, Consecrate your body as holy unto the Lord, which is your reasonable worship. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove what is the acceptable will of God. And so your mind and your body are trying to reconcile and get on the same page. You've got memories in your subconscious that are influencing you, that are lies of the enemy, whether you realize it or not. And that would be the enemy's equipment. Now, the enemy's equipment, those lies within your mind, feed the emotions that also are packed with memories. All your emotions are, are driven memories. And it's as though a memory is in your body and it is driving you. That's what an emotion is. And when certain neuropeptides get into certain receptors within your body, it literally unpacks and opens those memories that are stored in your body. And those memories become emotions. And so what we're looking at with the carnal nature, because listen, I am transparent. If I am not transparent, then I am not going to be any good to you. Because I would look like the super saint that doesn't need Jesus Christ. And that is not who I am. I need Jesus Christ. And I was reminded recently of emotions within my members that God needed to bring freedom to me because it was rising up and it was trying to bring fear. It was trying to bring condemnation. And we're going to look at when it comes to Romans 7 and Romans 8 because we're looking at the assignment of condemnation. Condemnation, it is the complete opposite of the spectrum of 1 John 4.18, which says perfect love drives out. It casts out fear where there is thought and dread of punishment. And those who have that thought of fear and dread of punishment need to mature in love. And so there are different areas within our soul. We're multifaceted. We're fragmented. We have memories that affect us in our subconscious, in our body. And so as a result, we might be more confident in one area than another area. For example, when I teach the Word of God, when I preach about God's goodness, I am full on confident. I am persuaded. I know what I know. It's not just scriptures that I've studied, but it's scriptures that I've experienced. As in Ephesians 3, 16 through 20, as in Mark 4, 19, 20 through 28. That hundredfold harvest has grown up within my person and that word is no longer a hidden truth, but the word has yielded a harvest and it is revealed truth. And so when I preach, when I teach, the robin that you see there is a totally different robin. It is the robin that is confident and people can come against me. They can persecute me. I'm not going to back down because I am fully persuaded I know what I know what I know. And like I tell other people, your argument will not persuade me. I'm fully persuaded. So you can argue all you want, 
But I know what I know, and I'm not going to be lured to another argument. It's just not going to happen. So be at peace, and let's not argue. Let's agree to disagree. Amen. In fact, arguing quarrels, as Scripture says, doesn't bear fruit. It, be it bears ungodly fruit. It's not fruitful. And so it's better just to keep the peace. And so that's the robin that you see when you see me teaching, when you, when you see me preaching. And there's other areas where I'm confident God has delivered me, like alcoholism, from areas of anger, from areas of insecurity. But there's still other areas that people don't see. My husband sees it just because I bear my soul to him. And so he sees areas where I still have insecurities, where the enemy comes against me, trying to condemn me to make me feel bad. And so in those areas, that is where the love of Christ needs to be perfected. Christ's love is perfected in certain areas of my soul, in certain emotions, in certain mind, in my mindset. But there's still other areas. I'm a work in progress. I've not fully arrived. The only person that ever has been is Jesus Christ and Him alone, who is the Son of God and Son of Man. Amen. And so when we're looking at this spirit of condemnation, this is going to be the trap of the enemy. And he is going to come at you when you're weak, and he is going to set traps to see if you will emotionally, from the carnal nature in your weaknesses, give in to that attack. He knows the assaults that work against you, and that is why God tells us to be vigilant, to guard our heart, to guard our mind. Because as Peter knows in 1 Peter 5, we see that the enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so that's what we're looking at today. And that's what's going on. And God is exposing this trap so you will not let a spirit of condemnation come against you. Hey, Sherry said, um, I love you. But you will stand your ground and you will know the love of the Father and you will not be brought into the courtroom of the accuser of the brethren, but you will let God prune you and you will get out of that courtroom, right? So let's look at Romans 7 and we're going to look at verse 20 and then we're going to go through 25 and then we're going to go to Romans 8, amen? So scripture says, now, if I do what I do not desire to do, it is no longer... In fact, let's start in verse 19. Well, let's start in verse 18, because it really gets to the point. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot perform it. I have the intention and urge to do what is right, but I don't have the power to carry it out. Who gives us the power? Holy Spirit. So areas that we're holding back on God, where the equipment of the enemy's lies, that stronghold, is oppressing us, is hindering us from receiving power. Amen? And that's what we're going to look at today, the power of Holy Spirit. Now, if I, uh, verse 19, for I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do are what I'm ever doing. Now, if I do what I do not desire to do, it is no longer I doing it. It is not myself that acts, but it's the sin principle which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul. So I find it to be a law, a rule of action of my being, that when I want to do what is right and good, evil is ever present with me and I'm subject to its insistent demands. For I endorse and delight in the law of God in my inmost self with my new nature. But I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and the wheels of the flesh, a different law 
rule of action at war against the law of my mind, my reason, making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs. And this is all before Romans 12. And this is what Paul is saying. When we look at Romans 12, make a decisive decision to dedicate, consecrate your body as holy as unto God, which is your reasonable worship, because he knows the struggle within his members. He knows what the carnal nature, the influence of those emotions that are driving the body. He knows that it totally is not in line with truth and it's at war. And this is what God is exposing in this hour. And this is what he is pruning. Because you might think, oh, I've been good for a while and I haven't had need of this. And then all of a sudden there's an unlovely behavior, which you have not ever noticed, that rises up. And you're like, where did that come from? I've never had an issue with this. What is going on? Yes, you have had issues. You just have not noticed. Because it has not been a, in a position to where you're tried and tested to get to that area of your soul where this issue is hidden. It's latent and God is now bringing the fire. He's exposing this issue and he is removing it from your person. And I like to think of as well 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul describes the thorn in the flesh, a messenger sent by Satan to buffet what? Not his spirit. Satan cannot touch your spirit, but Satan's messenger was sent to buffet the flesh. And so when you have that thorn in the flesh, and we see that Paul cried out three times, God, remove this from me. And then God told Paul, my grace is sufficient. We don't know this wrestling match, but he had one with the flesh, just like Jacob in Genesis 32. He had a wrestling match in the flesh that was meant by the power of God to remove it, to remove fear, to remove condemnation. And this is why Paul could talk about condemnation because that thorn that continually attacked him brought with it the condemnation of the enemy. And so let's look at verse 22. For I endorse and delight in the law of God in my inmost self with my new nature. Verse 23, but I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and wheels of the flesh, a different law a rule of action at war against the law of my mind and my reason, making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells where? In my bodily organs. Where does it dwell? In the body. Because remember, make a decisive dedication over what? Consecrate what? The body. Body means soma in Greek and means body, bodily, slave, it comes from sozo, which means deliverance, salvation. And so where the strong man is, when you're oppressed, Paul is describing it here, it is in the body. It's in the members of your body and it's equipment, as in Matthew 12, 29, where Jesus talks about buying the strong man and then you can empty his house of his equipment. The equipment is in the mind and it feeds that strong man in the body. And that's what we're looking at today because all of you who are viewing at some point, if you are not already there, there is a massive assault of the thorn of the messenger of Satan that is operating and is attacking in this hour. And God is allowing it because it is this test that is exposing what needs to be pruned because he wants us holy, right? So let's look at verse 24. Oh, unhappy 
and pitiable, wretched man that I am, who will release and deliver me from the shackles of the body of death? Oh, thank God, he will, through Jesus Christ, the anointed one, hallelujah, our Lord. So then indeed, I of myself with the mind and the heart serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And this is where we're going to go to Romans 8. And immediately out of the gate, this is the end of Romans 7, we see this wrestling match and he's wrestling with that nature in himself that needs to be driven out, pruned. And we see that he is addressing the purpose of the slanderer, the accuser, which is condemnation. And he immediately starts out in Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no judging guilty or wrong, for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk, not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law could not do. Its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit, sending his own Son and the guise of sinful flesh. Woo! Jesus overcame the flesh. Woo! Oh, I feel the anointing. Thank you, Jesus. And as an offering for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh subdued it, overcame it, deprived it of its power, and all over all who accepted the sacrifice. So who is our sacrifice? Jesus, amen. So that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the Spirit. Our lives are governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by Holy Spirit. And this is where we're going to go to Romans 8. And God wants to encourage you. And I'm telling you, I know that I know that I know. In fact, he keeps telling me, he wants me to actually do this Romans 8 verse 1 where we look at condemnation because I am telling you the enemy is so good. When he wants to attack me, he's not going to tempt me with beer. He's not going to tempt me with drugs. He's not going to tempt me uh, he's going he's not going to tempt me with uh, adultery. He's not going to do that. That's just not going to work with me. He is going to tempt me in my weakest areas in my personality where he can turn around and no matter how small it is, brain condemnation and try to accuse me as in 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 14. And we're going to look at that as well. So let's look at this word condemnation in Greek. Oh, I already know what word it's made out of. Made of. It's, it's got it's catacrema. I love that because you're going to cream the enemy. We're going to cream him in Jesus' name. He's trying to cream us. But we're not going to take his Krispy Kreme donuts. Amen? Those sugary things that are bad for our body, which is condemnation. You're eating condemnation. Oh, it tastes good. Eat condemnation. No, thank you. I don't want your Krispy Kreme donuts, Satan. This word is catacrema, so I, I'm sure it has the word kata, which means to be up and come down into in it. But we'll see it as we go along and dissect this word. Don't eat the Krispy Kreme donuts of Satan. Amen. So, catacrema means condemnation. It means an adverse sentence. This comes from the Greek word. It does come from two words. I knew we were going to get here. But it first comes from the next word, catacrino. Catacrino. What does the enemy know? He knows nothing but persecution, condemnation, slander. No, thank you, Satan. Don't want your Krispy Kreme donuts of slander. 
of persecution. I don't think so in Jesus' name. Amen. I want the pancakes of God's holy place. Woo! And it's so funny because tomorrow's Rich's birthday, and I'll post about it in the morning. But he loves Cracker Barrel pancakes. And we're going to eat Cracker Barrel pancakes. And in the Old Testament, in Leviticus... And in Exodus and Deuteronomy, we see in the holy place that they have cakes. We also see that in Song of Solomon 2, 4, when she is in the banqueting house of God, she eats on raisin cakes. That's the cakes we want. Amen. So this word katakrina means to judge against. It means sentence. It means condemn. It also means to damn, where you're damned by the enemy. That's what's going on. It is made of two words. And the first word is kata. And kata means to like come down and to look at and to enter into. I explain this when I do 2 Corinthians 3.18 and look at the mirror that is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But let's look at kata and let's look at the implications because it is massively long. It has so many words. Like, Let me show you. The Strong's Concordance. That is how many words that kata means. So kata means down, prepositionally, in place or time. It means in varied relations. It means according. It means against. It means along, among, alone, among, pertaining, concerning, covered, natural, particular, through, throughout, thus, uttermost. So it means a lot. Kata is used as a pre prefix to a word. To means its position alongside. And so the fact that this word kata is with this second word, which I cannot wait to look at what the second word is that makes up condemnation. It means that condemnation is not outside of you, but it's in the midst of you. It is covering you. You are in the place where you feel like you have to defend yourself. And that is why God says through Scripture that love covers, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers, 1 Peter 4, 8. And so let's look at the second word that also composes condemnation. I cannot wait. Are you ready? So it is krino. I've actually done that word before too. And krino means to separate. No wonder he is saying this in Romans 8. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It is that love that covers. It is that love that drives out fear. And that is what Paul is taking. Krina means decide, punish, separate, avenge, judge, call into question. Is that not what the enemy does? It means to think. It means to condemn, damn, and it means to side mentally and or judicially. And so it's literally a judgment that is in the midst of your person. And it's in the midst of the subconscious within your body where you have memory stored. And so all of a sudden, the stress response happens. You don't know why. Things just feel weird. And it is the enemy bringing that condemning sentence against your person like with me. The enemy will go, oh, you are so bad. You are so bad, Robin. And he's, I, and I was telling Rich this morning, I was like, Rich, I do not know why I think that. <laughs> why I have ever thought that for years. He knows maybe it came from that first ex-husband, that crazy husband that I was with. And so there is this pattern within my body, my members in that frailty of the flesh that the enemy unpacks and immediately says, you're bad, you're bad. And that is condemnation. That is condemnation from Satan. And it's in that place where God prunes that assignment off of our soul and he feels us and combats it with love. Where our weapon is love. Hallelujah. And we're not at the Krispy Kreme, Donut, Satan, Slander, or Persecutor place. We are in the holy place. Hallelujah. And we're eating the cakes of God. Woo! 
He says we are good. He says we are the righteousness of Christ. He says that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That we have the mind of Christ. That He has got hope. He has got a future for us. And He has not got harm for us. This is the place that we are looking. Now let's go to Romans 8. Let's go to verse 20. And we're going to read to the end of this chapter. And this is where Holy Spirit, because I am telling you, I am telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I know this. Two things. If you have not seen that prophetic word I put out the other day about the open door, see sun. See the sun. Instead of season, it's see sun, S-E-E-S-O-N, see sun. I am telling you, it is here. <laughs> And so the enemy is trying to keep us from entering into it by areas within our soul that God is allowing to be expressed where we feel like we're falling, we're failing God, and immediately he comes up as the condemner, the slanderer, the persecutor, right? And so you have to resist the enemy. And you have to get out of the drive through line in this quarantine of Krispy Kreme donuts, and I know I keep saying that. I don't know why God keeps saying that. Maybe you, maybe some of y'all are eating Krispy Kreme donuts and you need to repent. Hallelujah, Jesus' name. And He is getting you in the holy place because in that holy place, that is where Holy Spirit in your members, where your spirit led and Holy Spirit operates within your emotions, in your body, and you're yielded to the will of the Spirit, the will of God. No one knows a man's mind except for his spirit, 1 Corinthians 2. And Holy Spirit, knowing the mind of God, shows us things that are what? Fenced in and hidden. So let's look at verse 20, and let's go to the end of this chapter. Scripture says, For the creation, nature was subjected to frailty. To futility condemned to frustration. And we see actually this going on in that wrestling match, right? <clears throat> Not because of some intentional fault on its own part. Now, this is with nature. But the will of him who subjected it, yet with the hope that nature, creation itself, will be set free. Woo! Are you ready? <clears throat> From its bondage to decay and corruption <clears throat> and gain entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation of irrational creatures have been moaning together in the pains of labor until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, we have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit a foretaste of the blissful things to come, we groan inwardly as we wait for the redemption of what? Our bodies! Ding, 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 ding! Where's the strong man in the body? Where's the thorn in the body? What needs to be delivered? First, the body. And this is what people don't understand. They always think, okay, first my mind has to be delivered. And if you don't know those teachings, message me and just watch all the teachings I've done for the past year and you will understand. And this is why this church has such a struggle. And this is where the enemy is trying to uh, come against us. And I've even had people, you know, tell me they're concerned. Robin, I'm afraid I have the reprobate mind. You do not have the reprobate mind. Listen to me. I know you. You do not have the reprobate mind. But the opposite of the mind of Christ is the reprobate mind. But the enemy is bringing condemnation against our person so that anything, no matter how small, he condemns us and makes us think that we are this totally evil person. But it is the place where you're being pruned, where that which is in you, the thorn that's being exposed, that God is allowing it in order that it be cut off and for us to know our need. 
for Christ, for daily bread, for Holy Spirit. Amen. So verse 24, for in this hope we are saved, but hope, well, and let me finish verse 23. Let me start verse 23 all over again. And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, a foretaste of the blissful things to come. We groan inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies from sensuality and the grave, which real will reveal our adoption, our manifestation as God's sons. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope, the object which is seen, is not hope. For how can one hope for what he already sees? But if we hope for what is still unseen by us, we wait with patience and composure. Thank you, Jesus. So to the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. We know we need you, God. Comes to our aid and bears us up in our weaknesses. For we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according and in harmony to God's will. We are assured and we know that God being a partner in their labor, that all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, his design. For those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and he loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness, woo, that he might become the firstborn of many brethren. And those whom he thus foreordained, and here comes the pruning right here. Are you ready? He also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. Woo, he pruned. He acquitted. He made righteous. He pruned them. Hallelujah. He washed them. He cleansed them, putting them in right standing with himself. And those whom he justified, woo, those whom he pruned, hallelujah, he also glorified, raising them up, hallelujah, to a heavenly dignity and a condition and state of being. That's Isaiah 35, 8, the highway of holiness, the holy way, right? What then shall we say to all of this? If God is for us, woo, here it is, who can be against us? Who can be our foe? If God is on our side, hey, Virginia, he who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, thank you, Jesus, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all things? Woo! Who shall bring any charge? against God's elect. When it is God who justifies, he prunes, hallelujah, that is who puts us in right relation to himself. Who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Will God who acquits us? Who is there to condemn us? Will Christ Jesus the Messiah who died, or rather who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God actually pleading and interceding for us, who shall ever separate us from Christ's love, shall suffering 
affliction, tribulation, or calamity and distress, or persecution and hunger, or destitution, or peril, or sword, even as it is written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long, we are regarded and counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet amid all these things, we are more than conquerors. Woo! And gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. Hallelujah. For I am persuaded beyond doubt and am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things impending, and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is where we're going to end, saints. And this is where God is going to show you the holy place. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The holy place. He says in 1 Peter 1, 16 through 17, Be holy as I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 16. It is He that makes us holy. It is God that makes us holy. Amen. And so let's look at Song of Solomon. And let's see where in that holy place, our soul that is being justified, it's being sanctified. See, it's a journey. That God works on us bit by bit because he wants us to have the word inside of us, the revealed truth of the word so that we can stand. The word is our sword for us to put the enemy under our feet. And God is bringing you the revealed truth today that he has called you to be holy. He is pruning you. He is justifying you putting you in right standing with himself through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and his work on the cross and in his resurrection, and that God is causing areas within your person that need to be pruned. He is cutting that off, and you're no longer going to be eating those Krispy Kreme donuts, that Katakrina crema, you are going to be in the holy place, hallelujah, where you are eating the cakes of God because his banner over you is love in Jesus' name. Song of Solomon 2, 2 through 5. She said, I am only a little rose or an autumn crocus on the plain of Sharon, a humble lily of the valleys that grows in the deep and difficult places. But Solomon, remember Solomon means peace, shalom, right? Replied, like the lily among the thorns. See, God sees what needs to be pruned and the lily represents the purity, the holiness. And God sees the lily, woo! And he's pruning those thorns, amen? My love among the daughters, like an apple tree among the trees of the wood, she says, so is my beloved shepherd. She's tasting the fruit that he's good. He is good. He is working all things to her good. Good and good. He is good. He is working all things to your good. I don't care what you did last night where you failed. That's between you and God. But I know God is a delivering God by the power of Holy Spirit. And he can prune that thing off of you. And you can walk in grace, hallelujah, and not sin in that area anymore. Amen. That's how our God is. Like an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved shepherd. Among the sons, cried the girl, under his shadow. Woo! I delighted to sit. It was a covering from the heat. The heat represents the enemy. The scorching represents the wilderness. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to his banqueting house. Hallelujah. God can create a banqueting house in your wilderness. 
And that is Isaiah 4, 5, and 6. He puts a canopy over you where the scorch of the heat does not come nigh you. He covers you with love. Amen. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. For love waves as a protecting and comforting banner over my head and I was near him. Sustain me with raisins. Refresh me with apples for I am sick for love. Woo! I'm sick with love. Woo! If you're going to have any virus or any sickness in this hour, it needs to be for love. Amen? It doesn't have to be dis-ease. It can be God's ease. God's peace. Amen? And this is where we end as we look up this one last word. One last word. God wants me to look up that word, that Song of Solomon, where it's verse let me get it, Song of Songs. And we're looking at 2. Song of Songs 2. That's how it is in the King James Version to look it up. And we're going to look at... Hold on one second. We're going to look at this word. And we're going to look at, particularly, this word, sick. And see what it means. We're going to unpack this word. And this is where we're going to end. So this word, sick here, is chala. Chala. Hala, oh my goodness, it's composed of three Hebrew words. What? Okay, or it's compared to three Hebrew words, root words. So, hala is a primitive root word, but they compare it to three other different root words, like it's a likeness, or they are comparing it. And it means, are you ready? Oh my goodness, because remember how I talked about Genesis 32 and Jacob and wrestling? And he is rubbing against God. And I did that in my Rise and Shine teaching on my YouTube channel and in many of my books. And I used the James Dobson about kicking shins where his father kicked his shin. And I talked about it was rubbing the essence of manhood on him from his father. And that that was what God was doing in Genesis 32 with Jacob. That after that encounter with God, that experience of love that had driven out fear, the blessing to Jacob was, what is your name? Who are you, Jacob? That Jacob, I love how the Amplified Classic, he almost whispers it because his name doesn't fit him anymore. He recognizes he's not a conniver. He doesn't know who he is. And then God says, you are Israel because you have power with God. And man. And so this word sick means to be rubbed or worn. This is the wrestling match. Hallelujah. It means to be weak. It also means to beseech, entreat. It means to entreat. It means to pray, to make a prayer. It means to be uh, sorry. It means to be wounded. It means in travail. And this is where we're going to end right here with the three Hebrew letters that compose this word, chala, and they are chet, chet, lamed, and hey. Are you ready? So chet, C-H-E-T, is the ancient symbol of a fence or a secret place, a chamber, and it means to be separated, and it also means secret place. And so lamed, L-A-M-E-D, it's the ancient symbol that looks like a shepherd's staff with a prick in the curvature. It's a goad. And it means tongue control and authority. Amen. Because the enemy is going to be under your feet. You're not condemned because by the power of Christ Jesus, by Holy Spirit, by the tongue of God, you have control and authority where the enemy is under your feet. Right, right, it's John Luke 10, 19. Amen. And the last letter, Hebrew letter is hey, H-E-Y, a stick man worshiping God means to reveal. So the word picture of sick, are you ready? Is to be separated in the secret place where the control and authority of your tongue is revealed. Now listen to that. What does that sound like? The word. 
to be separated in the secret place of your heart where the, where the control and authority of your tongue. You have whatsoever you say. Amen. And out of our mouth, it's a fresh fountain. Listen, if we're speaking blessings out of one side of our mouth, and then we're speaking cursings on man, it doesn't matter if it's your enemy even, that's not the fountain of Holy Spirit. That's not holiness, right? And so within us is a living waters of Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with those living waters, we have the tongue of life. And we have authority over the enemy that he can no longer condemn us. He cannot accuse us. And he cannot use others to accuse us because they are not our judge. God alone, through Jesus Christ, who has been given all judgment from the Father, judges us, not people. Amen. So as we end here, saying to God, just be confident that God is pruning you. He is pruning you. You are going through trials and the testing of your faith, which is more precious than gold, to redound to your glory, praise, and honor when Christ, the anointed one, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, is revealed. And that's the fruits of righteousness, John 15, 8, that glorify the Father. Amen. God bless you. I love you. And I will see you next week. God bless you.